welcome back to the What the Fork Transfer Deadline Day special podcast. Um, we could be wrong, but it definitely feels like we may see some movement at the stadium light over the next sort of 24 hours, both incomings and outgoings. So we thought we'd band together, as promised on the podcast the other day, and just cast our thoughts out on deadline days and, you know, what we think we need, what we might need. Um, and what might actually happen. But um, before we get into it, obviously, we've got two of our usual guests that have joined me. Ross has had a, a day off. Um, first and foremost, Brad Sharp. Brad, how are you doing? Are you okay? Not really. Um, no. <laughs> as we know and no one else knows, um, driving home from work and my car's decided to break and the RAC has been out and said the engine's completely seized. So I'm waiting for recovery, sat in the SO petrol station at Durham. Apart from that, I'm very good. Well, my neighbours just fell through his ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the story I haven't got enough time to describe but yes um, in the passageway people will know about my, the leak that I've had in the ceiling people will be aware of that that same neighbour's lodger has just fell straight through the ceiling um, so we're at, we're at where we're at we'll continue on professional as ever but um, before we get in, digging in further into it Dave uh, you're joining us as well how are you doing are you okay? Yeah, very well, mate. A little bit more of a low-key Monday compared to you two, I think. So, uh, yeah, ticking along nicely. Honestly, like, I don't think you could match it. Um, But we've got rid of Ross and we've brought in an extra special guest. And it's been quite a while since you've been on the show, to be honest. But um, last but very much not least, BBC's Nick Barnes. Nick, how are you doing? Are you all right? Uh, Well, I think I'm relatively unscathed compared to everybody else today. Uh, I'm, I'm in serendipitous... Uh, mellow and very relaxed mood. Um, so I'm not sure whether that's going to wind everybody up or uh, hopefully uh, it, it might rub off on a few of the others. Yeah, fingers crossed. I think I need a bit of peace and calm in my life after the past week. But um, I was thinking before, I said it's been a while since you've been on the show. Obviously not a while since I've seen you, Nick. But last time you were on the show um, was a transfer deadline day special and we were having a chat about uh, whether Danny Graham would sign for Phil Parkinson Sunland or not. Things have come a long way, haven't they, Nick? Oh, they've come more than a long way. I mean, it's remarkable, <laughs> really, isn't it? I mean, I've been speaking to a few people today and and um, a lot of the talk about Sunderland at the moment is what a good place it is to be. You know, what, what a fantastic time to be a part of Sunderland Football Club. I think this is the first time in years that everyone's coming together and feeling optimistic, feeling that they're moving forward, got momentum, you know, for all the, you know, the good times that there have been in in pockets over the last few years, we've had cup finals, we've had Wembley's, you know, you name it. We've had one-off great matches at derbies. There's been no consistent feeling that the club's moving in the, in, in, you know, the right direction is moving somewhere that it's, it's building some sort of, solid foundations for the future and at the moment I just get a sense that the club all round with a fan base with the way that they're playing their football with the way that the, the the signings that they're making everything seems to be gelling at the moment everything's coming together it's, it's it feels rounded it feels positive um and we're moving in the right direction and and, and it's it's a great place to be it's a there's a real buzz about the football club at the moment yeah, it feels fantastic. I've seen a, a Twitter poll today where someone was asking if this is the best football side it is that, that they've seen in like the, the past 30, 40 years. And people were arguing about it and saying Peter Reid was better than the Phillips and Quinns. And I thought it's brilliant that that's what we're arguing about, though, isn't it? Um, compared to the last couple of years, it makes a change. Arguing but isn't it, about... isn't it brilliant that, that we're talking about <clears throat> that, that the Peter Reid era and that team, mm-hmm. that was more than 20 years ago. You know, that's a generation. That's more than a generation ago that we could talk about Sunderland Football Club, you know, when they were finishing seventh, when they were pushing you know, for Europe, you know, that 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 is a long, long time. There's a whole um, raft of people who've grown up watching, starting to watch football, say, uh, as a, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, back when Peter Reid's team was playing. They're now getting into their early 20s. They've had to wait that long before they can actually sort of re-experience something like that. Um, which is ridiculous in in lots of ways. Yeah, I was speaking to um, Saffron from Republica, which that that pod, podcast bit on Wednesday, and we were chatting about um, how good the team was and stuff like that when when we first started and when their song first came out, the Stadium Light. And I was thinking it's been twenty six years since the song was released, about twenty five years since since that time. And like you say, it, it, it's the first time I felt genuinely incredibly positive on a a long term 
in the long term sense about the club, uh, let alone the the short term because it's great on the field and it feels it feels really good off the field as well. But um, we are here for transfer days, so Brad, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, I think by the time I get this released. Uh, to be honest with you, I think that Joe Anderson is going to be a confirmed sign and he said he's goodbyes to Everton. So um, unless we've missed something completely and every single journalist on the, the face of the planet has got this wrong, I think by the point the point this goes out, Joe Anderson will be a Sunderland player. Um, your thoughts on the signing, Brad? It seems a bit um, a bit left to centre, signing a centre-half. I didn't really think we needed one necessarily. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, like most of our signings over the last sort of 18 months I don't know too much about but the recruitment team on the whole has got it spot on so I've got no reason to doubt that this wouldn't be another signing which is quite positive and quite exciting um, it wasn't a, a one where I think Nick on BBC on Total Sports and when you listen to Danny post game on the show they don't really mention centre-halves that were needed to come in I think we were quite well stocked um, but look it's a position that they feel like we can bring another guy in like your Dan Ballard to develop and move on with the club um, so yeah I mean I've got a lot of faith in what the, the recruitment team is seeing and who they're bringing in at the minute so it is quite exciting again it's another youth a young prospect from what they are right now with the Premier League side um, so yeah it's, it's just another positive step for the club for me um, it's another body in I mean does that mean maybe he's one of the more experienced ones at the back like Bailey Wright's been linked away. Does that mean he's going to be going? Quite possibly. Um, I'd be disappointed to see him go, but also is he sort of, he served as well. Is he one that's going to develop with the club? No. He's, he's I think he's hitting on 30 now, or maybe he's just over 30. Um, so maybe it is time for him to, to move on. And look, I, if he was to go, he'd, he'd go with my best wishes. He served us very well. Um, part of the team that got us promoted, part of the team that was in that good running towards the end of last season. So he would go with my best wishes and we sort of have that that plan in place for someone to come in and maybe replace him. Dave, same question to you. Obviously, I, I don't know much about Joe Anderson. Um, the only thing I would say is former under-21 captain of Everton reminds me of Morgan Feeney and that didn't work out very well and there's a random name for you. But um, I think we're working in a bit of a different market these days and I think you know, um, based on the, the players we've brought in over the past years, some of them, myself, have I've not been 100% sure on whether it's the right move with this model. They've all kind of worked out, barring one or two. So hopefully it's, this will be the same. But um, interesting that it's a centre-back, isn't it, Dave? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one thing which seems to be uh, very much thought of nowadays, I think I've read that he's uh, he's versatile as well, can play left-back. Um it seems to be something the club likes to focus on. Someone who's a little bit versatile uh, can fit in a number of positions. And of course, we know we've had our troubles at left back this season as well. So it's it's possibly not a bad move. And if I'm not mistaken, thought of quite highly at Everton as well. Um, I think he's made the first team squad on a number of occasions this season. Uh, so yeah, listen, it's it's hard to grumble with anyone we're signing at the minute, is it? Um, I don't think we've we've got too many negatives to say about anyone, and I think everyone's probably excited for Saturday to come and and see who who starts, who's in the squad. Um, yeah, fun times like we see it, don't we? Week in, week out, it's it's really hard to to find a a negative at the minute um, when everything seems so rounded. I mean, I remember previous ex managers talking about if you manage to turn the juggernaut round and get it sailed in the right way. It certainly feels as though we've got a little bit of momentum at the minute. Yeah, we're hitting a couple of icebergs on the way in the shape of Ross Stewart, like, but nonetheless, um, it's all very, very positive. Nick, slightly different question to yourself. Obviously, um, as you can hear from 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 our side, and I think a lot of Sunderland fans feel the same, there's, there's trust in that recruitment model at the moment because of their recent history. It's been 90% very good signings, and you have to really think about the ones that haven't worked out. Uh, so Joe Anderson seems like you know someone we should trust. He's he's at he's at a very big club in Everton that aren't performing at the moment. He's not getting games. He's twenty one. He's versatile, and he suits quote unquote the model that Sunderland have. But um, why does Sunderland want a, a centre half? That's one thing that's puzzled me a little bit. You might be able to shed a bit more light on that. Um, I can only think it's because they're trying to, you know, in the long run lower this age profile of the of the the team. Um, at the same time, though, I think Tony Mowbray 
has on several occasions in his press conferences sort of warned against the going down too far that road of youth because you you still need experience in the team. Danny Bart's there at the back. I mean, I'm I'm with Brad. I'm, I'm, I'd be a little bit disappointed if Bailey Wright does go, but Tony Mowbray says it's it's Bailey's decision. I mean, Bailey can can stay um, and and fight for his place, but he's obviously going to be down the pecking order. Or he can he, you know, he can he can move and and probably go somewhere where he's going to play regular football. But I know he has a big positive influence within the dressing room in terms of as does Corey Evans in 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 leadership, if you like. Um, so in, in that sense, I'd be disappointed to see Bailey Wright go. I think that they're mindful of that left side. I think that that, that was a good point made by Dave. I think it's it, this left sided issue. I think they're mindful of that because while they've got plenty of cover on the right hand side, you've got Luke O'Neill who can play right back, Lyndon Gooch who can play right back, Trey Hume's coming and doing a solid job at right back. Um, they've got right sided cover. They've not really got left side cover. Um, so I, I suspect that's part of the reason for them looking to recruit someone behind Elise, um, Dennis Serkin, and now you'll have your third left-sided centre-back stroke left-back fulfilling that age profile with Danny Bart as your, I guess, your experience, your leader in in in, in terms of your defenders. Um, Ballard's been very, very impressive. You, you can't, you know, doubt his ability. Hopefully... Hopefully, touch wood, we're not going to see him being injury prone because that's a big concern of mine regarding Ross Stewart. You know, for all the Ross Stewart is a fantastic striker, there's no question about that. When you take it, if you're looking in from the outside and you look at Ross Stewart's track record when it comes to injuries now, if you were a potential suitor for Ross Stewart, I think you start to be asking questions. He arrived with a, an injury, he picked up a thigh strain and was out for three months. He's now picked up potentially an Achilles injury, which could keep him out for a considerable amount of time. He's beginning to look like a little bit of a fragility. You know, there's a there's, there's a fragility about his body. Um, and that, I think, would raise a few alarm bells. But as I say, the other side of it is if you can keep him fit, he's undoubtedly a brilliant striker. So there's a bit of a dichotomy there because, you know, what do you do? Where do you go with a, a player in that situation? But coming back to, to you know Joe Anderson, I understand he's the under twenty ones captain at Everton. Presumably, doesn't feel that there's a pathway for him into the first team at Everton now. Probably less so with Sean Dyche coming in. Sean Dyche is going to go for experience. He's going to look for um, uh, you know people he can trust now, if you like, to get them out of the situation that they're in. This is not a place for the likes of Joe Anderson. And hopefully, it's not a place for the likes of Ellis Sims because. At the moment, Ellis Sims, the clubs, it, it, it's almost crying out for Ellis Sims to come back. Absolutely. And, and you, you literally took, I mean, you probably knew that Ellis was going to come uh, a point of conversation. I think, um, to my understanding, there's, there's been obviously conversation, and I think Tony Tony Mowbray has pretty much said as much. He's going to be a hot topic, Ellis Sims, for a, a number of reasons. And it's interesting you touched on Joe Anderson there, feeling that he's not going to get the team because they want experience. That makes total sense, I think. Uh, it's nothing against Sean Dyche. He's obviously a very good manager. knows knows his way around the football club, and he needs to keep that club up. and He's he's going to look towards experience, and maybe now is not the time to to blood young players. Which, um, if only Frank Lampard had thought of that about a month ago. But um, nonetheless, we you know we are where we are. But by your understanding, obviously, we're not in the room with Ellis Sims. We're not in Ellis Sims' head. We don't know these things, but you know we we do hear stuff from what you know. Where is a, Sunderland that with Ellis Sims and, and B, where is Ellis Sims heads at himself? Because surely I would expect he'd like to come back. Um, at this moment in time, I don't know. I know that when that night he he was called back to Everton, his dad was at Wigan with him. I think he was probably a little shell-shocked himself to be going back. Um, I, I think I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge leap to think or believe that he would want to come back he can't go anywhere else. He can't. He's he's unlikely to get in the in the Everton team, um, and he can't go anywhere but Sunderland, where he was seemingly happy, scoring goals, playing regularly. Um, I don't think, as I say, it's a big leap to imagine that he would want to come back. I think there should there must there must be dialogue between the two clubs. There'll be dialogue between Ellis Sims and his agent, and Ellis Sims and Everton. Um, I would be. I mean. 
you said before, by the time this goes out, things may have changed drastically. But I, I'm, I'm fairly sanguine about this. I would think if everybody bangs their heads together, they would see it's in Ellis Sims' best interest to come back to Sunderland until the end of the season, at least, if not beyond. That's an interesting one as well, because, and I'm completely speaking as a, as a fan here, um, you're saying at least to come back at the end of the season. Is it within Sunderland's remit? Is it within Everton's interest to send the player to Sunderland permanently for a good price? Because I would be very surprised if Sunderland didn't test a resolve. Obviously, he fits the model. We know what we're getting in terms of Ellis Sims. There's definitely, I was going to say, a rough diamond there. That's probably a bit harsh on Ellis. Um, he's a very good finisher, he's got, but you've got a lot of room to grow. Is it from A, from what you know, B, what you think within the realms of possibility that Ellis Sims could be a permanent Sunderland player as opposed to just a one to the end of the season? Um, I Personally, I think at the moment their, um, their main ambition will be just to get him back. I think the conversations about whether it becomes permanent or whether it, it, it you know, it, it is only a loan until the end of the season can, can probably stay on hold for the moment because I'm thinking if you're the Sunderland recruitment team, all of a sudden you're trying to find, well, A, you were trying to find a couple of strikers and probably a, a, a defender, as we now believe, is Joe Anderson. And this is without the added encumbrance of then having to find someone to cover for Corey Evans, someone to cover for Ross Stewart. I mean, heaven knows you know, how many hours now they're going to toil over trying to get players in over the next 48 hours, 24 hours. Um, I, I think my my biggest concern at the moment would be just getting back um, and pursue the conversation as to whether um, a player like Ellis Sims comes back permanently a little bit further down the line. I think it's crucially now with a timescale just to get bodies in through the door. And I think I don't think there's any need to panic because I think um, if they didn't if they didn't get him through the door or someone else. You know, we don't know what Lehaji is like. You've got Joe Gelhart that's come in. You've got Pierre Equa. You've got three players in, you know, who, who are filling holes and bolstering the squad. Um, you, you may have to sort of redirect your ambitions in terms of where you think you're going to finish at the end of the season. But when you go back to the beginning of the season, the ambition was to stay in the championship. I don't think there's any question now Sunderland are going to stay in the championship it's more a question of how how high can they finish, um, and any any finish above seventeenth, eighteenth, is you, you know still you you've got to you've got to take that with both hands and say, look, it's been a good season. You've achieved your aims, you've achieved your ambitions, and then you can build on those ambitions next season. Well, I want to come to you with the, the striker situation. Obviously, um, Ellison does the. I was going to say he's on our mind. He's on everyone's mind. Um, has been since August, if the song is correct. Um, but Brad, we talked a little bit um, before we knew what would happen with Ross Stewart. Obviously, what's happened has happened. It's unfortunate. It's gotten. It's awful. Um, thankfully, we got Joe Geltart in um, on uh, Friday, which alleviates a little bit of the pressure. But we still can't go the rest of the season, which is one striker. Um, but is one other striker enough because we sometimes talked about maybe getting one or two strikers in from a, a perspective of you and what you feel our ambitions could or should be this season. Do you feel that just bringing an LSMs would be enough for be able to cope with just the two strikers or, or do we need more than that? And so at least someone permanent even. Um, It's a strange one really, because it's the time of the Ross Stewart injury is, is really threw us off. Um, I would say looking at it now, we've got, Gelhart in. Um, if we were only to get Ellis Sims, for example, as I say, come back, would it be? I would it be perfect? No. Would it be manageable? I, I would say so. Probably, if he if he stayed fit. Now we have to remember Ellis Sims spent a lot of time out injured again, and he's only one knock away from, or we're only really one injury away from being in the same situation again. If we only got the one striker, um, there's only twenty four hours really to go. Would I be comfortable with only bringing Ellis Sims in? Yes. Would I be delighted? No. I, th- I think we do need two still. Um, but it's now, it's like you say, it's the time. And I think the club probably were thinking Sims and Geldhart, there's your two strikers coming in with Ross Stewart. Have they really got a con- contingency now? Because they would have had to have three, three irons in the fire, I would have thought. Um, and 
clubs now will look at it and think, well, they need a striker. We'll just we'll add another million on the price, or it's going to have to be a loan to someone. Realistically, if you're going to get a loan, they're not going to be informed that they haven't been playing. So we're going to be in the maybe the same situation as maybe Jack Clark and Patrick Roberts last year. They're going to have to come in, bide the time, build up a bit of fitness, and then see how they get on. Um, it's interesting about the Sims thing as well. I mean, we're talking about it, could it be permanent? I don't think Everton will want to send to to to, to sell him. Um, the main reason being is they don't know their status for next season and they've seen other Sims can, can perform in the championship. So if they were to go down, they've already got a strike on the books who will have championship experience and they wouldn't have to go and splash loads and loads of money on bringing another striker in. I think it, I think, I think he will come back. I think Everton will realise that it's best for his development, especially. Um, he can't just sit on the bench. It, it's it's negligent, really. It's negligent to... to up to now to have him sat on the bench for best part of four weeks. I mean, if he comes back, is he going to need a week or two to get up to match fitness? That that's the worry as well. Um, can I can I just interrupt here and then, and I'm just wonder what what do people think about Lihaji? Because technically he is a striker, so I I, I wonder are are we you know I don't know much about him. I don't know what his, his physique's like here or what, what is where does he fit into the the picture at the moment. Where where does he fit into the jigsaw? I find it quite an interesting one. Sorry, Brad. Um, yeah. I find it quite an interesting one in the sense that um, obviously it's a hugely big signing. Like based on his, his his recent history, he's a golden boy. All that kind of stuff's come from Leeds, he's played in the Champions League and that sort of stuff. But I did kind of look at a player as someone who could potentially come in for the future because I'm like I don't think we need to rush him into the team because he looks more like a winger to me from what I've seen of the. It, it depends, I suppose, if Christian Speakman sees him as a Leon Diaku kind of striker, which I he's not a striker, um, or is he, or can he play up front? I think what would be quite interesting with any player that comes from abroad and comes into the, the new league, Nick, from my side, is that I'm not comparing him to Thierry Henry here at all, but Thierry Henry came to England as a winger and ended up being the best Premier League striker that's probably ever existed um, because that's the way his, his game suited the Premier League. I do wonder if this lad's game more suits being a central striker or does it suit someone that's more of a um, a playmaker, a sister, a number 10, a, a left winger, a right winger, someone across that sort of front three. I think what will probably benefit him is that he's got a lot of players and he's what's deemed as this natural position that can play there and are playing well so he can naturally bet in. But it, it wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility for for me, Nick, if based on what Speakman had said about Leon Diagu, he classes him as another option up front and still classes Diallo as another option. And it's something that probably, because he hasn't actually technically been part of the squad yet, we haven't really thought of. And one thing you can say, um, it sounds like I'm having a bit of a dig with the Diagu thing, I suppose I am in some ways, is that the potential of Lee Hajj in comparison to Diagu is vastly different. Um, so obviously this Lee Hajj kid, seemingly has a lot more about him than maybe what Diaku does. Um, we're talking to someone who's played in the Champions League and played for Lille, not just being part of a Champions League squad and never, ever actually played for Bayern Munich in the sense, um, in, at high level, the way that Diaku hadn't at the time. But it's, it's an interesting point. Um, personally, I'd feel a lot more comfortable if we had Geltart, Sims and another um, as a an out-and-out striker, but I am greedy. Um, Dave, where where do you sit on that? Is that an interesting point that Lee Hodge could potentially go up front because he's he's deemed as someone who can play in that position? Yeah, I think it could well be interesting um, in about eight days' time because it wouldn't surprise me if something like that ends up uh, coming to fruition in the replay against Fulham um, because yeah, he can't he can't play in the replay, can he? Ah, uh, can he not? No, the the problem is the problem with the replay is that. You have to submit your squad list before the first game. If you're not in the squad list, you can't play in the replay. Right. So that's that's. I mean, and Gell Hart's rule ruled out through. Um, he played in the first um, the previous round against Cardiff. So the, the the squad that they took to Fulham is the squad that they have to use at. Okay. Okay. The replay. That's sort of that's. Uh, I, I knew Joe Gell Hart wasn't allowed to play in that game. I didn't realize about the Lahadji one. So that's a pity. Um, yeah. I... Again, it's only clips that we've seen, isn't it? It's it's two and a half minute YouTube clips that we've seen. He looks quite explosive. He, he looks quite piercy. 
Um, and I think I think we mentioned it earlier between us all. It, it's something we seem to look for now. There's a that I think we can start to figure out the profile of the type of players that we're after. Um, people with resealable value, people who we can develop, people who fit into a a style of football that we play, which is very exciting. Um, and also people who can be uh, utilised in different areas. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely something which is going to be looked at because ultimately we will all look at it as fans and the ideal scenario and the best situation that we can get out of it. And yes, of course, that will be having three fit centre forwards. Will the club think the way we do? Well, it's very easy for us to spend their money, isn't it? It's it's uh, it's particularly easy when it's not you writing the zeros on checkbooks and stuff like that. So, if I did see another lonely mention today, possibly was it the the young kid from Arsenal, Nathan Butler uh, Ayadeji? Yeah. Um, easy for you to say it rather than me. That, well, you can't even, you can't even pronounce Geldhart, mate. So uh... <laughs> yeah, well, well, we, we've had plenty of pelters about that. <laughs> but um, I would suspect if if there was a guy like that coming in, and it, it's just my feelings, but if there was a guy like that coming in, he would surely be coming in as the third option. I couldn't imagine for the life of me that he would come in um, to kind of try and make the biggest impact for the rest of the season. Although I'm sure said player would massively disagree with me, and rightly so. Um, so, yeah, I, I think all the irons are... That's the wrong way of saying it, because the it's not how we act as a club anymore, which is nice to see. But I think there will be a big percentage of the recruitment team who would love Ellis Sims back, and it just makes sense. And I think that would be number one target without actually seeing it out loud too much. I mean, it didn't make any sense for Everton to be bidding £25 million for Jokeres, Um, another name I can pronounce, by the way, Dave. Um, and then be also banking on Ellis Sims to have some kind of Conor Wickham-esque sort of impact towards the end of the season. It's quite clear he's back for numbers, not for impact. Um, and he's going to have to perform very, very well and do something very, very special in a very, very short space of time to be considered as anything like someone who's going to get game time. But I wanted to actually bring that up with you, Nick. It was a really interesting link. It felt a little bit Kaziah Sterling for my liking, but I am scored. Uh, Nathan Butler, I, I, uh, I had not heard anything of that sort from anyone, not that I'm loaded with sources, but it's a bit left field. Have you heard anything on that? No, it's interesting though, isn't it? I mean, there's been a lot of talk over this last year, I suppose, about how the club has kept everything really, really quiet. There's been, you know, we used to see name after name banded about on social media being linked with, with Sunderland. And now we don't. Yes. Occasionally, you know, there are names, but there's nothing like it used to be. So they're keeping a very, very tight lid on, you know, the speculation and and who they're looking at. I mean, there's no question they've got, um, because Christian speakers made no secret of the fact they've got a big database and they've got a big, um, network now, if you like, of scouts and people looking at players. And Stuart Harvey's been spending a lot of time in in South America, and and you'd assume that someone like Christian Speakman, Stuart Harvey, with all their experience, have got very very good contacts with Premier League clubs and academy managers. I mean, where where, where Sunderland have, have taken where, where they've really, I think one of the the, the the cutest bits of business they've done in the last year year and a half is to tap into that change from clubs having to have under 23 teams to under 21 teams. So someone was really smart a year or two ago and said, there's going to be a glut of 21, 22, 23 year old players on the market because they're now no longer seen as being viable for the under 23 teams because there isn't an under 23 team, but they're also no longer viable to get into the first team at those particular clubs because they're still on that, that development path. And so Sunderland have come in and said, right, here we go. We can snaffle the likes of Dennis Serkin and, Jack Clark, and they're lucky because they got Paul Bracewell down at Tottenham in charge of the, or what was the under twenty threes, and and you can you can snaffle players like Niall Huggins, you've you've got you know your Trey Hume from Ireland. They're suddenly and then this South American and French market, and the French connection must surely come from Kirill Louis Dreyfus and Juan Satori. Um, so they've got this this nice network in place, and they've taken advantage of that. 
and have, have, have constructed deals whereby you're going to get a very, very good player in, for example, Dennis Serkin. And you know that down the line, if, if it works, he is going to be worth 10, 15 million pounds. And you can, pr- if, if Tottenham were to come back for him, you're still going to make a profit of seven or eight million pounds on, on that particular player. So, as I say, going back to the original point, they're keeping a lid on on who they're looking at. But it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if they're looking at a young player at Arsenal or a young player at Leeds, another young player at Tottenham, because there are, these players must be available because they're not going to get at this moment in time into the first team in, in, in any of those clubs. And they'll be looking for that experience. And Sunderland are already making, they are definitely making a name for themselves now as the club to come to. If you are a young player and you want to be developed and you want to be playing championship football, Sunderland are going to give you that opportunity. Sunderland are going to be careful that they don't have too many because they've got, as Tony Mowbray says, we've got to balance. I have to, I've got this balance of wanting to play players and keep players happy. You know, the player's not in the team like Trey Hume wasn't and was banging on the door to play. He's got to keep those players happy. Um, so far, so good. And, and, as fate would have it, to a certain extent, they've achieved it because of injuries, the injuries to Gooch, um, Elise, and so on. Um, and in many ways, it's a nice position to be in. But, um, you know, we'll know in a day's time, won't we? We'll know who's coming in, who's going, and, and we'll have that sort of sense on Wednesday morning of, what, right, where are we now? Where is this squad? Who's going to play where? Are we going to get Gail Hart in the team? at whose expense, because you can't drop Roberts, you can't drop Ahmad, you can't drop Clark, who's going to play the number nine role. Dan Neal or A and other will be playing the Corey Evans role. Will Mishu continue in the, the number eight role or will Equa come in and play that role? I mean, it's, a, it, 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 it's in so many ways a good place to be. I was going to ask, how much does that benefit us going into the last day of the window? I mean, it was only a couple of seasons ago on Netflix that we were scrambling about with whatever money we had in the kitty to buy a player with a good song. Um, and we weren't seen as a club that could be anything but someone you could literally, pardon my French, take the piss out of. Because um, it happened for a number of years with the likes of Jack Rodwell and, and the players would be Alvarez, who we're still paying for, allegedly, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we also had that played out with, with Donald on Netflix. Um, whereas now we can probably be, I assume, a little bit more, um, I don't want to say picky, but Geltart was wanted by everyone in the championship. He spoiled club as Wigan. It looked like he was nailed on to go there. And he, and he chose Sunderland because of what we've done with Diallo, what we've done with Roberts, what we've done with Clark. The list is endless, really. Um, how much of a benefit do you think that's going to play in on the transfer deadline day, say if maybe there's two or three players after player X, Y, or Z, and they're all championship teams, and and some of one of them ones interested, surely that that plays into our hands, isn't it? Well, I think Saturday's game against Fulham will have been a big help as well. I think I, I've had that that number of conversations with people today about wow, how impressive was Sunderland at Fulham? Now, if we're saying that, you know, in a relatively small circle of people. What are people saying around the country? Most people watching football would have watched Match of the Day or whatever and heard about Sunderland's performance and seen what Sunderland are doing and how they're playing their football. And that's not lost on football clubs. It's not lost on agents. It's not lost not lost on players. I think going into these like this sort of last 24 hours, it puts Sunderland in a very strong position. I think the Gelhart deal is perhaps an illustration of that to get a player from under the noses of Blackburn and Swansea and, and Wigan to an extent that he wants to come here. I think that, you know, that's, that, that's a, you know, that's a big tick. Um, so I think going into this sort of final day of the transfer window, I think Sunderland, they, they've got to be in a strong position because I think suddenly Sunderland are back on the map. People are sitting up and taking notice again and actually they're watching what this what what does this project mean you know what are Sunderland doing I mean then you know a year or two ago we were talking about Brentford and what they were doing and how Brentford had been successful at the, the, the model they adopted and, and and Brentford have now established themselves uh, you know albeit it's always a bit of a fragile foundation but they've established themselves in inverted commas in the Premier League on the model that they've adapted Brighton uh, have got their model um, and they've established themselves. And now I think people are sitting up and taking notice of the next 
in, in some ways, we're the next Brighton, we're the next Brentford, Sunderland, the next people, that next club that people are sitting up and taking notice of. Yeah, hundred percent. It does feel like that, um, which is just a, a massive positive. I'm trying to find the negative here, but it's quite difficult. Um, Brad, I wanted to obviously throw the the last talking point that we've got here because I think the the big there's a lot of chat about Ross Stewart, right? It's done to death. We don't know yet. It doesn't look good either way. It, it's not great, even in the best case scenario. I think it just does not look great at all. But because of how important Ross is, it's probably been glossed over a little bit that we're going to lose Corey Evans for the rest of the season. Um, and I know that you were previously not as big as fan, but I think collectively we're all quite a big fan of Corey Evans these days. Um, Alex Neil an awful lot about wanting experienced players in there. There was the likes of James McCarthy, LinkedIn, stuff like that. And I think Alex Neil felt he could have a real goal if he could get a little bit of more experienced players within the squad. Tony Mowbray seemed more than happy to, to go with like these younger boys and, and he's done a really good job. He's done a fantastic job. He's obviously been the best man for it. Um, but he's made slight murmurs that, you know, as Nick said before, he might want a few more experienced players in because of the experience that he's potentially losing, which could be, as we've discussed, Bailey Wright and Ross is 26, 27. He's not going to be ready for the rest of the season. I'd be very surprised. And Corey Evans, who's our captain and ultimately our leader, is completely out for the rest of the season. Um, how likely do you think it is that we'll see not just a midfielder? Or actually, I'm going to change that question. How much do you think we need a just not a midfielder, but an experienced head in the middle that can kind of do quote unquote the Corey Evans role? Um <clears throat> it's funny because if you asked me that a couple of weeks ago, I'd say it was vital even with Corey Evans being fit. Now, if Dan Neal can keep performing the way he has done, I'm more than happy for him to play there. But you are right. In the bigger picture, yes, we do need an experienced head in there. Um, even if it is for if Dan Neal has a dip like he did last season. And I know Nick had a, a long conversation with Dan and he wasn't too happy about being brought out the side, but the kid was running the ground. We can't do we, we can't really risk doing that again because we come to the business end of the season in the last 10 games. Is there anyone that could maybe come in for him? The way we look at the minutes, there's only Equa, really, who could there play there. And that kid hasn't played a professional game except when he came in for 20 minutes at the weekend. Um... The other options are that was at the club is only really Luke or Nine, but he's a centre half. Then like I know he loves playing midfield, but he is a centre half. Um Pritchard in a deeper role, but then you're not really getting the best from Pritchard and where, where he, he's he's more suited and we we see the best from him, which is the high press. So from a, a long answer for a quick question is yes, I think we do need someone experienced in the middle. I don't think I I can see it happening now. I think the priorities are elsewhere, and that is as, as a striker. Um, I, I would like to see it happen, but I just can't see it happening now. I think things have happened over this weekend where there, there's a bigger priority for the club. Um, I think they've seen Dan Neal can sit in there, and he's done very, very well. He's probably been the standout player since Christmas, barring obviously Yam Adam Roberts. He's been absolutely phenomenal. Is someone going to come in and think, I'm going to have to wait? Who is experienced? I'm going to have to wait until Dan has a dip in form, then I'm going to get me chance. Mm. No, I, I can't see it happening. I would like it too, but I can't see it happening. I think, I think the club now are looking at one striker, possibly two, and I think that that's all we'll see coming in now. Yeah, potentially. Dave, I'll, I'll throw the same question to you. Um, for, for clarity, I, I definitely think we need some experience in the middle, but I'm kind of with Brad on that. I think... You know, unless we're bringing in someone like a, I think even like you like I mentioned Ben Pearson the other day on the podcast. I mentioned him on the, on the old Twitter, and um, realistically, even the likes of Ben Pearson, it's not going to want to come to play second fiddle. He doesn't really fit into the model, uh, and I just think if you're going to buy him, you could be probably pay more money than you'd be comfortable with. Um, and that's just an example of a player. So I suppose it is difficult, but I do feel we need. Some experience, um, but enough of my rambling, Dave. Do you, do you kind of agree with me on that? Yeah, again, as from a fan's point of view, we'd we'd love we'd love to see an experienced man in there. I think the one thing to remember um, potentially will be players who could potentially get through the end of this window, um, not get a move, not have any 
semblance of a, a move or any kind of idea of it. And I think someone that was mentioned a deer um, was uh, Josh Omnua from Fulham. Apologies because the pronunciation is probably terrible again. But um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, again, 28 year old. Um, potentially could get his contract cancelled, which then means he's a free transfer, which then means we've got more time to get a deal like that sorted. Now, I'm not saying it would be him, but there is probably a number of players out there who could be in that situation who may well get a bit of a cancellation of contracts and then become available, which means we wouldn't have to rush through the business in the next 24 hours. So that could be an avenue worth worth exploring. Um and also one thing for, for for as much as we go on about the model, that is something that would kind of fit in with our model itself of of reigniting someone's career when it's maybe he's gone a little bit stagnant and a little bit stale. Um, listen, you know, Jack Clark, okay, younger, resaleable value, but Paddy Roberts, Paddy Roberts has probably gone a little bit stagnant and is now bearing fruit of uh, a, a great run in the team. Um, so yeah, I think there is a possibility of a of a late late um, signing potentially. Who it would be, I'm not quite sure, but I haven't got the list. I've, I, I know a few people who probably do. Yeah, um, Nick, I wanted to throw that one at you as well before we we close off on a couple of questions. I have really short ones. Um, you touched on before Tony Mowbray was kind of indicating he would like. A little bit more experience in because of the the, the older quote unquote heads that he's lost. Um, is there a chance of it actually happening, or do you think we'll stick with Equa being the the uh, Corey Evans replacement? I, I, I think there's a chance. I actually, you know, I think that's a good point made by Dave about the um the, the market with with free agents. I think um you know Brad's right. Dan Neal has stepped into that role really really well, and there's no doubt. I think over the coming weeks. He can play that role and be very effective. I think you know where we we're going into the unknown is when we get to the last ten games of the season. You know, is that is that where Dan Neal is going to be fatigued or affected by um, playing that role week in week out? And, and we've got extra games now. You know, you've got the extra game against Fulham midweek. We've got the Rotherham game rearranged midweek. You're getting to this scenario now. We've got Queens Park Rangers midweek. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we're getting two games a week over the next month. Um, and that 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 you know, as Dave says, there will be players who fit the bill experience-wise out of contract after January. Clubs releasing them, you know, uh, it, that that could that could come in and fulfil a role. So I wouldn't get. I'm not too downhearted about um, the Evans situation because I think there is cover there, and I think there are players, and there that there probably is availability. Um, I think I, I just think overall, I'm I'm still very optimistic about the way the season's going. I mean, I think every time that Sunderland have come up against a, a crisis this season, in inverted commas, they've, they've dealt with it. I mean, we've, we've, we've got through the three months without Stuart and Sims, and here we are a point off the playoffs. So we, it, it's it's not as though Sunderland are in a bad place. They're actually actually in a very good place at the moment, having overcome those problems already. And that was, and, and, and that was before... Ahmad and Roberts have found the form that they've found before Dan Neal has found the form that he's found. We've now got Ballard and Bart back as the, the, the two centre-backs. It's probably the best partnership we've seen all season. We've got Hume in at right-back and he's been outstanding. At least he's back in at left-back and we know what Sirkin can deliver. So I think, you know, Pritchard to come back. We're again in a very strong position if you if you look at it in, in the overall sense of the what the way that the season's gone so far and where they are in the table and don't forget they're still in the fourth round of the FA Cup with the potential of a fifth round tie against Leeds you know if you'd offered that to everybody at the start of the season I think most people would have bitten your hands off for it yeah absolutely. I mean we felt like every single review show we've done in this this season has been positive even when it hasn't been positive like Cardiff at home we were like well as long as we respond next week and yeah, there's, there's so many huge positives considering how many, as I said before, icebergs we've hit. Um, like the Ross Stewart double injury, Ellis Sims. We lost our manager four games in. Um, we couldn't have had more problems than we've had this season, yet somehow a point outside of the playoffs. And I don't think anyone can plan 
Um, don't get me wrong, I'd have liked a striker in before, obviously, Sims and Stewart got injured and it felt a bit inevitable. But the likes of like losing your captain for the rest of the season, your manager walking out and going to Stoke, it's just stuff you can't plan for. This is Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I don't think anyone can even see that um, in advance. There's a couple of questions I, I wanted to ask, Nick, before I let you go. Um, you touched on Pritchard there. I think Pritchard's been a really interesting one because it's kind of been forgotten that for such a good player, such an important player and such an um, important person in the dressing room, it seems, hasn't played for the past few weeks and he's contacts up in six months and it doesn't seem like anything's imminent. Um, I don't know why this is just a hunch. I know nothing about this whatsoever. But is there a possibility we could see Pritchard leaving? We've got a lot of young boys coming in performing very well in his position. He's out injured and he's contacts up in less than six months now. I, I think there's a possibility. I and mean, when I heard, heard a month or two back that he 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 may well be moving south because his 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 wife was unhappy in the north and wanted to move back down south. Um, I y- y- you can never say never, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. I I think you know that this is it's a strange relationship I think that Tony Mowbray has with Alex Pritchard. I mean he you know he's the first to admit he's chippy and he's he, he's the first to leap up in team meetings and you know, argue with, with Tony Mowbray, but at the same time, Mowbray likes him for that and likes what he brings to the team. Well, we know what he brings to the team. I mean, he's, you know, on his day, he is that player that Huddersfield spent all that money on. Um, but I, I I think it comes back as well to the question you posed earlier on about why are they bringing in Joe Anderson, a 21-year-old centre-back, when we seemingly have quite a few centre-backs. I think it's this move to... to, to um, building a young squad and over the next year, slowly but surely, the more the, the older players are starting to be sort of weeded out, if you like, to be replaced by these younger players and this sort of rolling development of, of younger players. I mean, Luke O'Neill was mentioned and, and it's Luke O'Neill's story now is fascinating because he's going to struggle to get back in at centre-back because Bart and Ballard are playing so well. He's going to struggle to get in at right-back because Hume... And Gooch are probably ahead of him at right back. Can he go in and play the Corey Evans role? I don't think he can because I think he's too ill disciplined to play that role. So, so what? What? Where do you put Luke O'Neill now? Luke O'Neill, who was at centre back, first one of the first names on the team sheet, is now going to come back from suspension and arguably find it very, very difficult to get back in the team. Now, if you're in, that, that's great for a manager in one sense or a head coach because you've got players of his talent in your squad, but you've then somehow got to keep them happy. And they will get an opportunity because there'll be injuries or suspensions or whatever, and he will get back in because that's the nature of football. But it makes this sort of second half of the season now, because you've now signed Equa, Lehaji, Gelthart, um, you, you know, it's it's going to make the second half of the season very, very interesting in terms of where you slot these players in, how you keep these players happy, and how does this squad now develop it, as part of this project? And whilst we're on contracts, there's one thing that we haven't mentioned for about three days um, since Saturday. Um, Ross Stewart, obviously, officially his contract ends in the end of the season, but we know we can trigger that extension. It's been a, a long conversation and it's been debated across the fan base a million and one times, and there's about a million and different one, a million and one different opinions, Nick. But he's now got an injury which let's be honest worst case scenario that could be the best part of nine months to a year if it's a, a ruptured Achilles hopefully it won't be and he's back sooner but it, you touched on it before about his potential injury proneness now I'm going to be honest I love Ross more than anyone on the planet but prior to the season he came to Sunderland he had quite a few knocks at Ross County over the past few seasons he's only really had the one season which is what clubs will look at I mean I'm not, personally I don't think he will be injury prone Um, I think it's just bad luck but Clubs don't think like me because they're spending lots and lots of money and millions of pounds. Now, there's a discussion around how much money we should pay him, discussion on how much he's apparently been offered. We've all heard different things. This injury does throw a spanner in the works for for both because it changes the situation a little bit. Where do you think this injury to Ross Stewart puts the situation with his contract in? Do we just renew, Do we just extend it for the extra year and then reassess when he's fit? Or do you think... There's discussions going on, or do you think that potentially something will now see this as a risk? There's there's so many different options. Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, as you say, there are so many different options now. And what on what stance does the club take? Um, what stance does Ross Stewart and his agent take? Uh, what what stance does Ross take in the sense of I you know, I think what Ross hopes or wants in the next year and a half is a punt at the Premier League. 
I think he wants at 27 years old and now probably 28 to prove to himself and to everybody that he can play in the Premier League. Now that is in doubt now because of the, we, as you say, we don't know the extent of the injury, but there's got to be a question mark about how soon he's going to be able to get or fulfil that dream. I think if you start looking at it like that, then you've got to start thinking about your own security and you know where where are you going to be in a couple of years' time and how secure are you going to be? I, I think if the club's put an offer on the table now, I think both parties will look at it. And I think, as I understood it, you know the club's got a, a, um, a bar at which they're not going to go any higher, um, but offering a fairly long-term deal. If I was Ross Stewart now with that injury, I think I would probably... I would probably accept that deal and say, look, I'm going to be three, four times better off than I am now financially and with four and a half, five years security if the worst comes to the worst. Because if he signs that deal, he's got that security. Um, and he and he knows that in a year's time or wh- however long it might be before he comes back, if a Premier League club is interested, they will come in and, you know, it ups his price. But so what? Premier League clubs can pay that. Um and I think all round that would probably be the best, seems to me the most logical, mo- most common sense road to go down at the moment. It sounds pretty good to me as well, actually. So, Ross, if you are listening, just get it signed. I fully agree with Nick. I think it's a great idea. Um, we never know what's going to happen. And like you said, Nick, there's sometimes names that we've never heard of in the sign the next day. And I kind of personally really liked the way that works. Um, thankfully, I'm a journalist, not for Sunderland, so I don't have that issue. I said, I'm sure you would like the... Uh, the names a few days prior, but I suppose from a fan perspective, it is great. But um, fab to have you on. I'm so pleased we're not discussing whether Danny Graham is going to be re-signing at Sunderland or not. And that was only under two years ago you were on that podcast, I believe. So uh, if you want to feel good about Sunderland, well, anyone? To put things into context, it was a year ago yesterday, I think it was, that Sunderland lost 6-0 at Bolton. And and now look where Sunderland are. And I, I think if, if, you, if you look at it in the round, you look at it in the context and the perspective of that, I don't see how anybody really can have much to complain about. Yeah. Which means which means it's only a year ago tomorrow that we had a, a, a bald 50-year-old man running around the Academy of Light looking for the parents' door. <laughs> and breaking all the exclusives and showing, showing, <laughs> showing all us journalists up, especially war, uh, the man at Sky. Um, but um, Brad, Dave, Nick, thanks very much for joining me. Hopefully it's a really exciting day with... Um, no outgoings that we would prefer not to be outgoings and, and plenty of incomings that we necessarily need. But um, nonetheless, I'm sure it's going to be exciting. It's been a really exciting season, a really exciting time to follow someone at the minute and um, onwards and upwards. But but thanks very much, guys. Thanks for thanks for having me and I appreciate you coming on. Great. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, mate.